And finally, since uh, I'm very curious, maybe you are as well, to see what's inside one of these things, let's open it up. Uh, I don't expect this to take much time because there's not really too much in here that's interesting. So one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, from a technological perspective, if you think about what these uh, cable adapters are, in many ways they use the same technologies as cable modems. The, the, the standard that they conform to, MOCA, I don't know how related it is to DOCSIS, which is the cable modem standard. I'm sure there are some similarities, but fundamentally, this is just a cable modem that's designed to connect to its own sort of device, instead of, you know, the cable modems that you have from your provider. Oh, wow. Oh, you know what? Let's see. Ah, yes, there's more screws underneath there. Yeah, all right. Are they here? Oh, wow, there's a lot of screws in holding this device together. So yeah, from a technological perspective, the, the, they function very similarly to what a cable modem with your ISP does. The only difference is, obviously, they don't connect to your ISP, they connect to another device on the cable line. It's funny, if you look at a lot of the settings, like the channel settings, or the um, there's attenuation settings in this guy, uh, it's very similar to, again, like an ISP-provided cable modem. In fact, I once had a problem I had cable internet at my home. I now have uh, VDSL uh, because everybody in my neighborhood has cable internet and uh, it really started slowing down in the evenings. But anyways, um, when I had cable internet in this home, I had I, I was having intermittent connection problems where the, the modem would go offline for a while and, you know, the standard, turn it off, turn it on again, and it would reboot and you'd be fine until the next time and it wasn't and blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that the signal strength from my cable provider was actually too strong and the internal attenuation in the cable modem wasn't enough to compensate. So when they kept asking me, what are your signal levels? And I'd report them and I looked it up. I'm like, wow, those signal levels are really good. Why am I having problems? Well, the tech mentioned that for the particular cable modem I had, it was saturating the front end and that was causing my connection problems. So what he did is he installed an, uh, a physical attenuation device um, at my uh, DMARC point. I don't know if DMARC is the right thing to say for cable, but that's what I'm saying. Anyways, okay, so let's open this up. Yay. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, very neat. All right, well, I do have a few things to say here. I'm really impressed by the, um, this is getting crazy. I'm impressed by build quality again. So, yeah, what's interesting is this guy does not have any integrated PCB antennas, as far as I can see. It looks like they actually have, so I, if you can see them, I'm hoping, yeah. There are four antennas here. Well, obviously, four connections here. I forgot what this connector is called. It's micro something, I think. But there are four antennas. There's one here, 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 and here. And based on the size, it's clear these two are the 2.4 gigahertz uh, antennas, and these two are the 5 gigahertz antennas. I should have, you know, you could, you could tell from the uh, configuration panel, but there are two APs in here. There are two wireless stacks in here that uh, it looks like, or at least, you know, there's the PA in here and stuff like that, but it is very separate. That, yeah, that's impressive. Okay, uh, what else do we have in here? Well, as expected, not much. Oh, uh, I didn't mention it up here. This guy here is a WPS button. Probably want to disable that if you're going to use this. But, well, it's a convenience factor. Uh, well, if you're interested, there's a, what looks to be a JTAG connector. It's too bad I can't... Uh, this is, like, glued on, so I can't take these two apart. But that here is what I'd assume is a JTAG connector for programming this thing. Anything else of interest? Oh, okay, so the main chip device RTL8198. I'll see if I can find a quick data sheet or spec sheet on that. But it really, you know, it really does look like this thing is just that one chip. That one chip does it all. 
Um, yeah, so here there's a little box for the actual cable connection. I would assume that's mostly just uh, Phi type stuff. I was curious whether this had a uh, switch chip uh, for the two Ethernet ports, because it does have two gigabit Ethernet ports. And I wasn't sure how it would do that, but it looks like the SOC here actually does support two separate Ethernet ports. So I would expect, you know, the switching performance to be gigabit on these two. You know, modern day gigabit um, Ethernet, you don't really have the bandwidth limitations you used to have between ports. What else do we have in here? Oh, that's interesting. It's first off, we have more LEDs than we have, or more light pipes than we have LEDs. What I am curious is what's that for? I'm not sure. It says Geo here, but I believe that refers to the LED, and that corresponds with, oh, the first Ethernet port. <laughs> um, Gigabit Ethernet Zero, not Geo. All right, well, you know, that's about it. This here would be, I would assume, firmware, so the flash chip. Power supply stuff here. I don't know why this is under a can, so it could be this is part of the cable solution. I'm not sure. I'm not going to rip these cans off. I don't really see a purpose to that. There are some, uh, there are some components here that are not populated. But I don't, I, I'm not sure what those are. All right, well, you know, I didn't expect there to be too much in here but uh yeah i'm very impressed i i do like the uh, the fact that they're using actual uh antennas that aren't on the pcb and the reason for that is that they're in different orientations like you see how this one is on a right angle or sorry a 45 degree angle and this one down here so this is all about i'm not sure how familiar you are with rf just in general but the orientation of an antenna can matter well, can matter a very large amount. So if you have one antenna sticking straight up and one antenna going sideways, if you're dealing with uh, horizontal or vertical polarized RF, those two streams are basically invisible to each other. So if you think about, say, the antenna on your car, on your car, um, that is a vertical element right? That's vertical polarization. So that means your radio station has an antenna that's also vertical, and that is the optimal receiving position. TV antennas, if you think about them, those elements are always horizontal. So what that tells you is the transmitting antenna is transmitting horizontally. You can actually take advantage of this. So for satellite communications, there are two types of polarization, but We'll stick with the simpler one, because I don't want to go into circular polarization. That one always confuses me. For what, what happens in satellites is you actually, the satellite antenna in the feed horn, you, you'll actually have two elements, one oriented vertically and one oriented horizontally. And they both transmit data on the same frequencies. And on the receiving end, your little, you know, pizza box sized dish for, for DBS, uh, will inside, if you open up the LNB, uh, or what they call the LNB, which is actually an integrated uh, feed horn, um, antenna elements, and a low noise block amplifier, you will see the same, or, uh, same uh, well, depending which service you use. If, if you're using a service that uses horizontal and vertical polarization, you will see the same thing. So in the same unit, you have two separate streams on the same frequency. And because the two antenna are orthogonal to each other, they both ideally, it's not perfect, but they both ideally pick up two separate data streams. So you double the bandwidth in that channel, the channel being the space between the satellite and your receiver. Okay, so why am I saying all that? The point is, if you have a signal that's horizontal, uh, vertically polarized, and you have your antenna oriented horizontally, ideally you'll receive no signal, which is bad. Uh, especially for Wi-Fi, where you're dealing with multiple devices, multiple orientations. So what devices on either end of, of the radio link do for Wi-Fi is they try to diversify their antenna configurations. So in this case, you see an antenna that's at 45 degrees and an antenna here that's at, say, 90 or whatever, 180 degrees, depending on your point of reference. And, and that hopefully will help you have one antenna that receives 
good enough to get a good signal. As for the 2.4 gigahertz antennas, um, how does this guy go together? Their orientations, ah, their orientations are both at a 45 degree angle. So there's one here and there's one there. But when you put the guy together, you'll notice that they're like this, which is exactly what I was saying. So even though in Wi-Fi you're dealing, basically what they're doing is they're transmitting and receiving both polarizations in the hope that the, the, the endpoint device has a similar orientation to one of the antennas and to optimize the, the, the RF link. So that's why they do that sort of thing. And that is why I like having these separate antennas in this device because if they were all PCB mount, you know, you could have an antenna go that way and that way and that way and that way, whatever. But they're all within the same plane, which is not optimal. Look, we're, we're not talking about perfection here. So Wi-Fi in general, there are a lot of compromises made in the, the RF link budgets, but uh, you do the best you can. So I'm really impressed by how this thing is built. Uh, I like the antennas how they're oriented, the fact that they're separate. Antenna design is really a form of, of almost voodoo. Like if you look at the shape of this antenna, it looks like a triangle with a little thing on the side. That's something you do a lot of modeling to try and figure out. Uh, you can't see on the 2.4 what the elements look like, but you do a lot of modeling to try and find the optimal pattern. It's a very complicated thing, especially when you're dealing with very high frequencies. Uh, 5 gigahertz is, I think, today still considered very high. I don't know. It is to me. That's all I have. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. And until next time.